Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Okay, folks, here we are. We're live. This is episode 80. I'm Jack Murphy, here with co-host Dave Park. And our guest tonight is Chris Hoare. He is the son of the legendary Congo mercenary, Mad Mike Hoare. Uh, I've just finished reading his book tonight, uh, about an you know, hour and a half before we started the show here. Um, so I just finished it in my mind. This was a really great book. Um, I really enjoyed it, Chris. And uh, I can't wait to talk to you about your dad and about the book itself. Well, thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, you're a, you're a legend here yourself, Chris, uh, especially doing this from South Africa where it's 2 in the morning or 3 in the morning right now. That's right, and a sweltering night. Uh, if, if you, you, I don't think you want to be here right now. It's very uncomfortable. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, we typically start the show by asking about the guest's origin story, and yours is quite specific to to the book and intrinsic of course to you know father and son relationship could you tell us about a young chris Hoare coming into the world and your upbringing and you know start to get into your relationship with your dad yes well after the war the second world war my father and mother went back from india and probably we'll talk about that um, and so I was born in London, and uh, but London was no place to be after the war. There was food rationing and many other problems. And, uh, and Mike had had a taste of Africa during the war, just a brief visit to Cape Town. And uh, so they decided to emigrate to South Africa, and they ended up in Durban, a port city, which uh, has also been described as the last outpost of the British Empire. So it suited them very well, being British. And um, so, so that's where I grew up, in a, in a suburb, a leafy suburb. Um, Mike did very well in business. So I, I had a privileged uh, childhood. Uh, unfortunately, um, the marriage ended when I was about 10 years old. Um, it was unsustainable, really, because Mike was an adventurer, first and foremost. And every year he would go off uh, on adventures for, for three or more months uh, at a time. And uh, this was unsustainable. And uh, I'll never forget, he, he more or less... He, he was not good with emotional things, um, but he more or less took me aside and said, look, this wasn't part of the plan, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you the best education available in South Africa. And uh, so he did. He sent me to the best schools, a great university. Um, and it, it's not that he disappeared. Uh, I, I was you know, spent a, a lot of time with him. He had a beautiful yacht in Durban, and I spent my teenage years with him on, on that yacht, um, in a way. And uh, yes, and then uh, I had just started in journalism when, when I got this uh, dream telegram uh, from him. You probably don't even know what, what a telegram is. <laughs> and uh, he... He said, I bought a, a 23 meter yacht uh, in Spain. Uh, we're moored in Alicante. Get here uh, as soon as you can. And so that was the start of a, uh, of a gap year, what was supposed to be a gap year, and which ended up as a 10 year uh, gap year. I, I rather enjoyed um, my gap year sailing and, uh, and doing many other things. And, and, and so I prolonged it. Um, and, and then I went back into journalism in South Africa. 
you know, I think I'm something of a free spirit. I don't fit in well in, in like many people in, in other places. Um, journalism seems to be a home for, for people like that. And so I've made a living all through my life with words and photographs in, in different types of journalism, uh, public relations and uh, desktop publishing and now book publishing. So it's all to do with words. Um, just to go back to my, my tenure gap year, I, I traveled a lot. I, I studied French in Paris. I, I learned Italian in, uh, in Italy. I worked in a Swiss, Swiss ski resort as a handyman. You know, I've done lots of uh, different things. And, uh, and, and here we are now. Yes, uh, I'm a book publisher. <laughs> Chris, what age did you realize that your dad wasn't necessarily like other dads? <laughs> you know, that you say he was an adventurer and things like that. Like, when did, that, when did you realize that wasn't normal? Uh, look, I think as a, as, a, as a boy, you don't know any different, but um, I, I, my best friend was the, the, the guy of my age across the road, and his father was a chartered accountant, just like my father, and he worked in town, but he only got two weeks leave a year, mm -hmm. and he would spend that time turning these beautiful wooden bowls on his lathe in his workshop. And my dad, you know, would, would ride from Cape Town to Cairo on a motorbike. So you, you do realize that, that, that he is different. Uh, but, but in another way, uh, I mean, he was British. And, uh, you know, in amongst all the many of the other dads who were, were South African. So I also realized he was different in that way. Um, yeah, so you, 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 you do realize early on. You know, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, what was it like for young Chris growing up with a guy who the press dubbed Mad Mike? Um, you know, you, you, he comes across as, as a, a good-natured, nice person. You know, like you said, a, a bit emotionally distant, perhaps because of his own upbringing. Yeah. But... Not a bad person, not a me not a mean father. Uh, like for instance, there's this funny bit in your book about how your your father didn't believe in using curse words, but you write Mike did not regard the word bloody as a swear word and used it all the time. In fact, it was his standard adjective for banks, literary agents, certain British publishers, the Australian accent, the Labour Party in Britain, Belgian sh Belgian sh soldiers in the Congo, and anyone who incurred his wrath. <laughs> Yes, you, you, you know, he, he, he went to a, a good British boarding school, so he was brought up uh, properly, you, you could say, and then seven years as an officer in the British Army. After all that, you are haka, you know, you are polite, conservative, punctual, uh, well-mannered, and, and, and Mike was all of these things. He, um, I, I, I must tell you, um, just about every time I've introduced anybody to my dad, who, they've never met him before, and now they want to meet him, everybody wants to meet him. So I introduce them, and even after 20 seconds or, or 20 minutes or, or hours or whatever it is, they come away, Perplexed, they're more or less scratching their heads and saying, Chris, your dad, this is what they say, your dad, he's so polite. And I realized they were expecting what, what you just said, the hired killer, right. <laughs> the war dog, no pistol on his belt. You know, and he's talking about Shakespeare and poetry in, in a very polite manner. So, so the mad, well, we all know mad, uh, it, of course it can mean sort of clinically insane, but in, in this case it means bold, adventurous, uh, daring, and, and, and Mike was, was all of those things, but in an understated way. 
He was, uh, how tall was he? Because everyone mentions in, the, in your book that he was quite short of, of stature, um, surprisingly. Yes, that's right. The, and that was part of the problem because, you know, a guy, Mad Mike, you know, he's six foot six. He's right. uh, a bigger, much bigger beard than you. <laughs> and, uh, but no, uh, you know, I've got his war record from the British Army in the Second World War, and it tells us that he was five foot seven which is uh, 1.7 meters um, at his tallest. So, so he was short, you know, he was a chartered accountant. He had everything against him turning into a, a, an adventurer. And what he had was a brilliant mind and uh, personal magnetism. I know, I know it's a cliche, but he had charisma and charm. And this took him a long way. Yeah. Well, then, why don't we get into talking a little bit, if we're to back up a little bit um, and talk about your father's upbringing, um, you know, from Ireland to India and, and, and so forth. Right. Uh, every article I've ever read about him will tell you that he was Dublin-born. Now, the truth of the matter is that he was Calcutta born, which doesn't have the same ring about it, does it? <laughs> and um, see, Mike came from a long line of seafarers, and the family tree actually shows, going back a few centuries, one of them was described as a privateer, which is a kind of another name for a pirate. Mm -hmm. you know, these guys, they came from a small town, Rush, outside Dublin. And, you know, times were hard. And you made a living however you could. And some of them were privateers and they would rob uh, other boats out at sea. And uh, so Mike had this bit of a pedigree of, of a pirate. And his father had uh, qualified as a master mariner under sail in about 1908 and then got married and gone to India where he worked in the port um, for the Port Authority as a river pilot. And so that's where Mike was born. There were five children. and But at the age of eight, the Mike um, and the whole family went to England and, and installed him at, at a school in, in England. And he didn't see his parents hardly ever for the rest of his uh, childhood because in the summer holidays in in britain you, in those days you couldn't fly to to india for the holiday right. you 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 stayed at school very often and you know i'm going to mention all these little building blocks as as we go along and and people will see you know how are these building blocks equipped Mike to deal with and to become what he became? And the first one, apart from the heritage of piracy, was um, the he was put in the care of a uh, former army uh, sergeant uh, who had fought, and, and this is almost unbelievable, in the Anglo-Boer War in South Africa in 1900. So now we're talking 1935, there were 30s. And, uh, and during the holidays, this guy, Sergeant Badcock, would take Mike and the other boys in his care. No TV, no cell phones. What do you do? You tell stories. And so he infused Mike with a military fervor and an adventurous heart. And, and that's, that's how it all started. But he first, before he could become a, you know, a, a mercenary legend, so to speak, he was an accountant. He went to, he went to work wearing striped pants. <laughs> yes, yes I, 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 he would always say the same sentence. So it's been ingrained in my brain. You know, he, probably they said, journalists would say, why did you... Give it up, he said, I got bored with going down to the city of London, the financial district, 
uh, in striped pants. And uh, yeah, he, he started, he wanted to go into the army when he left school, but unfortunately his father died and it was just financially impossible. And so he got a job uh, doing articles uh, for a firm of accountants. And um, uh, then, so he started that number of years and then the war intervened. And then he continued after the war and qualified after the war. But he, he did end up uh, in the British military during the war. Yes, that's right. Um, after his exposure to stories about the British military, that's what he wanted to do. And in 1939, he joined the reserve force, the territorials, and uh, obviously enjoyed it. And when war was declared on the 3rd of September, Mike um, uh, reported for duty and, and his life in the British Army began. And he, he loved it. Uh, uh, you know, we all know Article Clark's don't earn enough to pay for the bus fare to get to, to work. So, so now he was doing three meals a day and mostly a, a, you know, a bed with blankets. So, so he was happy. And he had some, uh, it seems like he really, uh, you know, succeeded and, and even thrived in the military as a trainer and somebody who was able to impart I mean, again, you can see, I think, the, the beginnings of something there as he's training these soldiers and in, in skills and receives high marks from his superiors for doing that. Yes. Uh, I think people might be surprised to hear that he spent uh, quite, quite a big chunk, maybe even the first half of, of the Second World War in training. He went to small arms school, uh, loved small arms, came back, became a very a very good trainer. There was a lot of teacher in Mike. And um, then he, he went to officer school where uh, he, he shone. He, he, there were only two A-grade guys at the end of the course, and he was one of them. So, so he was really cut out. You know, he was a brilliant marksman, a, a brilliant leader. He became a very good leader. So... Um, he was cut out for the military life. Uh, what was the uh, second half of his, of his time during the war after that? Yes, well, they were then told to report to, I think it was Glasgow, and they were put on a ship and issued, believe it or not, with helmets, which had been used in the First World War. And they were not told where they were going. Uh, it was a secret, and of course, they ended up um, crossing the Atlantic to South America and then b across back again to Cape Town, and this was Mike's introduction to, to Africa. Now, he was beginning to get the feel of what he had heard about during his school holidays, and he loved Cape Town, and another Thing that he always used to say to journalists was um, he came to Africa because there was sunshine, pretty girls, and regular guys driving Cadillacs. So, you know, why wouldn't for <laughs> what what more can you ask for in life? So so that's what uh, what drew him to Africa. He obviously made a note, this is a nice place to be. Um, and, and true enough, he came back after the war. So, so now he's in India. They ended up in India. And uh, he was in combined ops. You know, he had joined the Ricky Regiment by now. And um, uh, he had still, by 19, uh, early 1944, hadn't seen any action. So uh, then their unit was called uh, to assist at the famous Battle of Kohima. Kohima was one of the most vicious uh, and famous and uh, a turning point in the Second World War in that theater. Um, because if the Japanese had got through at Kohima, 
they would have taken the whole of India and who knows where it would have ended. So that is where my first saw action in Kohima uh, against the Japanese and then later in Burma. And uh, his role model was a brigadier, Bernard Ferguson, who was an aristocrat and who talk, taught Mike how to, how to lead. I don't want to overstate the case, Mike probably saw less action than most people would have realized, but he also was posted to uh, HQ in New Delhi, where he learned about the planning side of running an army, which was also to stand him in very good stead in the Congo. And of course, the war in New Delhi was very different. There were tennis parties, dancing parties, lots of girls. And of course, my mother had grown up in India. Her parents were in the British government there. And um, the next thing they got married um, in February 1945. And before he was out of the British military, correct me if I'm wrong, and, and I'm crossing my wires about something else I read in the book. Wasn't there uh, an incident where... Uh, there were protesters in India. It was like the beginning of Mohandas Gandhi's movement. Yes, that's right. Um, um, I think it was in Pune, which is where the, the first base where, where Mike was. Uh, there, there was a local protest about something. Mm -hmm. And um, pro probably, uh, I don't know if, uh, if Gandhi was present personally, I don't think so. But um, so Mike went, um, I think he was by now a second lieutenant in an armored vehicle uh, with the way it was done in India was you had to take a magistrate with you to to put down the uprising. And he, he would say, I'm signing this pink ticket now, which was a sort of authorization, um, take out that man there. And, and then Mike would give the instruction to, to somebody. And, and he said all it took was, was one shot, and, and then the crowd would disperse. So why don't we get into then after the war and how your dad and, and family lands in South Africa, and which eventually leads us into... Uh, the decolonization of the Belgian Congo, of course. Yes, all right. So um, we're talking about the 50s now. <clears throat> Mike um, set up in business in, in Durban uh, in what he used to call the motor business. He actually set up as an accountant, but it didn't work. Uh, he, he, he couldn't understand why. And he went around to the other accountants and said, what's the problem? I'm London qualified. And they said, oh, yes, but you didn't go to Hilton or Michael House, which were the two best schools. And so then and there, he vowed that his sons would go to those, one of those schools. And that is actually what happened. Um, but then he started adventuring. Um, and it was hiking in the mountains, documenting uh, what they called Bushman paintings in caves at that time. Uh, then in the very high mountains uh, for Africa anyway, um, uh, over 3,000 meters uh, across cross country in uh, what was known as Basutu land, sometimes with a pony and a guide, sometimes not, you know, for two weeks at a time. Um, and then... Uh, Cape Town to Cairo on, motor, on a motorbike, and then Mombasa to Lobito, that's uh, east to west, the following year, and other minor adventures, um, and then safaris. Uh, he, he, he went, well, before that, he went looking for what, what everybody who was anybody in those days went looking for the lost city of the Kalahari Desert. It was reputed to be a, a lost city there. And so Mike went looking for it, and, and he didn't find it. But, but what he found, Mike was an entrepreneur. You know, he, he, there were many aspects to his life. And he saw an opportunity to lead safaris in, in the, in, across the desert and into this 
water wonderland called the Okavango Delta. And truly, it's a magnificent place. And, and so uh, he thinks he was probably the first person to lead safaris there. Um, three Land Rovers, uh, 15 men, um, and three cooks. And um, the interesting thing about this is that on one of the safaris, there was a man who reported to be the American vice consul at the consulate in Durban, and, and he was not. But um, he, he and Mike hit it off. You know, they were both adventurous, uh, literate, um, politically savvy, uh, bright, and, and, you know, with great sense of humor. And, and uh, this guy, his name was Don Rickard, he was CIA. And he and Mike became best friends. And it was Rickard who uh, uh, explained, if you like, the situation to Mike the way he saw it. Remember, this was the Cold War days. Communists were going to take over Africa. And soon Mike was, you know, fell in step with Ricard's uh, political thinking. And of course, this was the beginning of uh, uh, very big things. You know, now the accountant, five foot seven, good mannered accountant turned adventurer. Now he is about to expose himself to a warfare in the Congo. Um, yeah, after, uh, after doing a year of safaris, um, the Congo became independent. All hell broke loose. Uh, the richest province, which was known as Katanga, uh, seceded from the Congo. They had the copper. And, and the bulk of the minerals, and they said, you know, we're, we're out of here. And, and uh, of course, the rest of the world didn't like that idea. Um, you, you know, uh, we, we've all heard of Lumumba. He was uh, the first prime minister of the Congo, but he was aligned with Russia and China. And... Um, America didn't like that idea. We can discuss that. Um, so Katanga needed help. So they employed what was called gendarmes. It was a very small affair. Um, a recruiter came to Durban and Rickard, no doubt, egged Mike on and said, you go. <laughs> That's what they do, isn't it? Um, and, uh, and, and so Mike went, and, and he wasn't in charge but he, he, of the whole show, but he was in charge of a, of a unit of 120 English speakers, and, and it, it, it was a sideshow. I, I don't want to pretend that it was anything very much, um, and, and after a few months they were, uh, they were thrown out uh, of the Congo. But... Mike had met influential people and started to make a name for himself. I mean, he, he must have met, no doubt, lots of Rhodesian and South African mercenaries, uh, amongst others. I mean, wasn't Bob Denard one of the other mercenary commanders in that outfit? I'm not 100% sure if, if Bob Denard was, was in Katanga. Uh, Certainly, he was there in 64 and 65. Um, Mike was in charge of a unit called Five Commando, which was the English speakers, and Denard was in charge of Six Commando, which was the French speakers. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, they, they, their paths did not cross that much. Um, but I think Mike uh, pretty soon... Uh, developed a certain amount of disrespect for for Denard, you know, um, starting with the way they dressed. You know, Mike was a Paka British Army officer, mm -hmm. and he hated everything that was not the way the British did it. So uh, <laughs> the French would wear shoes with rolled down socks, 
as opposed to long and shorts, uh, as opposed to long trousers with boots, etc. Et so yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm just flipping through the pages, and you know, some parts I have uh, highlighted. There was the one mercenary that got left behind. It was the son of a, a millionaire, and they ended up flying around the country trying to locate him. Yes, that's right, Donaldson. Um, he was your your archetypal adventurer, tall, dark, and handsome. He spoke Swahili. He was a natural leader. And there was a point in Katanga where Mike's unit was holed up and their enemy, if you like, at that point was the United Nations peacekeeping force. And uh, it was all rather pally pally and uh, they even went to some kind of entertainment show that the United Nations forces had put on one night. But very soon, the UN said, we're going to arrest you guys. And Mike said, we're out of here. And they escaped into the bush. But Donaldson and another man uh, were not well at that particular moment, you know, malaria and all sorts of other problems. And they took a jeep and went another way. And unfortunately, they ended up in the, an enemy, uh, the Baluba tribe from the north of Katanga were another enemy of Katanga. So Katanga had a lot of enemies and, and un unfortunately they were uh, ritually tortured and, and most likely uh, eaten. So it, it, it was a disaster. And yes, uh, Donaldson's father was a, a millionaire mining magnate and um, got hold of Mike and said, we've, we've got to go and look for him. So they did an aerial search and they, they sent a patrol. Uh, the father even went on the patrol and eventually they did find the Jeep and, and did get the, the story uh, from the locals and Mike was described at, at, uh, in a book as being ruthless. Um, and uh, of course, I never saw that side of him, but apparently in retribution, he ordered the, that village to be burnt down, there were 500 huts. Uh, if that's ruthless, well, that's warfare. Yeah, well, well, we'll get into that, I think, when the, the second trip into the Congo, where, you know, your father also had to be a strict disciplinarian when you're running a mercenary army. And uh, I know I know he didn't like the term ragtag army being applied to his men. But I, I mean, there were some brigands in the ranks, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, I guess after after that whole first incident in the Congo, um do you want to talk about Don? Don Rickard was an interesting character in this book, the CIA officer, and um, I'm, I feel like I'm going to have to go look up some of his work. I do you want to mention the time he came over for drinks and had and had a loose tongue talking about Nelson Mandela? <laughs> yes, sure. Um, <laughs> all right, so so they were best friends. This is now post Katanga. Uh, Mike has remarried uh, Phyllis, is mm -hmm. his second wife. She she is much younger, and um, uh, Chubby Checker and uh, what was his name? Bob Haley, somebody Haley, were were all the rage, and they had uh, a bunch of people uh, around for a party, and um, for all that, M Mike. Mike did very well at parties, but he didn't always relish the idea of going to parties. Um, but the nice thing about parties for him was that there were going to be a number of attractive women there, and he would always, he was a flirt. He would flirt with them, and he would engage with them, uh, uh, doing repartee to see if they could keep up with him, and uh, boy, oh boy, if he, if he found a, a woman who could keep up with him at repartee, well, he had her firmly in his sights because he loved that kind of thing. 
Anyway, Rickard and his wife were at this party, and Mike didn't like it when people stayed longer than he thinks he thought they should stay. Mm -hmm. And so now it was after midnight, and he he came up with this what he thought was a clever idea to get rid of all these people are drinking his booze and <laughs> not going home. <laughs> so, so he said, I'll tell you what, why don't we all stand around in a circle, probably there were 10 or 15 of them, and we'll make a one-minute speech, and then you all go home. And, and uh, you know, there was some, he, he had, uh, you know, there was some, top people there who were able to make spontaneous witty speeches. And now it's Rickard. I don't know if, if Rickard was caught uh, not knowing what to say, but uh, probably because he'd had too many drinks, he uh, told the story about how in August 1962, which was uh, probably about six months before the party, Nelson Mandela, uh, who was the head of the uh, African National Congress's military wing, amongst other things, and uh, they had decided uh, to, that uh, violence was no longer out of the question, and uh, Mandela had been for military training in various places, and uh, he had been arrested and tried on, on and released um, but now he had gone underground, and he was on the run, and he came to Durban and uh, went to a party, maybe Rickard was at that party, I don't know, but Rickard knew where he was, and knew that he was going to be driving to Johannesburg the next day, disguised as a chauffeur for um, a well-known, I think he was a a theatrical personality and uh, so he tipped off the police and I understand uh, I'm not quite sure how true it is but I understand that he told a journalist that Nelson Mandela was a dangerous man and was a communist the most dangerous communist outside of Moscow and he had to be stopped and I was going to stop him. And that's what he did. He, he, and then, of course, M Mandela was arrested and later tried with a whole bunch of other people and sentenced to, to many years in jail. He served uh, 27 years in jail before he was free. And Rickard had to be sent home over this, right? Because of such a violation? Well... Absolutely. With, within a week, he, he was back in America wow. with, with his whole family. And uh, I, I think um, probably, you know, didn't have a glittering career as a result. Um, he had grown up in Burma, interestingly, um, and, and was sent back to Burma with the, the CIA uh, and eventually ended up in a small town in, in Colorado. Yeah, I, I can only picture somebody at the CIA be like, yeah, you're going to go hang out in Burma for a while now. Yeah, which was, that was 1960s, early 1960s is not much out there. Uh, and you also realize that we have six <laughs> degrees of separation from Nelson Mandela. There you go. Just a thought. Um, and then... Uh, well, before we get to the legend, uh, it is worth, I think, going back just to talk about, you know, during this time period, Mike was back to running safaris and in various adventures. And there's one story you relate in the book that's like pretty horrific, horrifying to, to think about where Mike goes out with his, his second wife, Phyllis, and they get some sort of jungle fever. Uh, something like malaria. Uh, I can't remember what the what the name of it was, if it even has a name. But like one by one, everyone on the expedition starts collapsing with a fever, and and his wife almost dies. I mean, that that was just a, a horrendous affair from the way you wrote it. Yes, 
It, it, it certainly was. And the interesting thing is that all these um, many disasters, Mark had a number of them, and not on quite such a grand scale as that one, but uh, it didn't stop him. He carried on trying to, to, mm -hmm. to, to live out his philosophy, which was you get more out of life by living dangerously. So what happened there was uh, he was now going to run safaris on a grander scale, and he had this place in the Okavango Delta, a, a, an absolute paradise, and they were setting up the camp. Uh, he and Phyllis, and he had employed four men to, to assist the the interesting thing about the, the Okavango Delta is that every year the, 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 the rivers in Angola flow down into the delta and actually never make it to the sea. They, they dissipate into the Kalahari Sands. Really? And um, um, this year there had been a particularly high flood. There's always a flood, but this year was particularly high. And so it brought with it a greater incidence of malaria. And Mike was warned about this, but he, he carried on. And after a few weeks of setting up camp, uh, one of the men went down with a fever. Then Phyllis, uh, went down with similar symptoms and uh, interestingly the, the traditional bush remedy for uh, well they they diagnosed her as having had a black water fever is that you take a 44 gallon drum put it next to the patient's bed and they have to drink that whole quantity of water and you appoint somebody to make sure that they do um, yeah, so, so, so Phyllis also went down and uh, now they, they had to, to, to move her and the other man uh, in the small boat um, back to where the truck was. The trouble was access into this place, which was called Buma, um, was via at the last part, Hippo Pass, paths through the papyrus that hippos make. They're only about two meters wide. And so with the flood, all the uh, floating material, etc., had clogged up these pathways. And so Mike, in his small boat, couldn't get out of there. And um, well, it's, it's quite a long story, but eventually he had to leave the boat and walk back to the camp and round up some of the guys still in the middle of that night on, on the first day, and they came back and they eventually managed to get free, but everything was against them. You know, it was a long way now by boat, but he knew someone who had a fast boat, but when they got there, the guy had uh, When they got to the truck, um, the battery was flat and nothing they could do would, 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 would start the truck. Now, Phyllis is dying, um, one man has already died and another man has gone down. So th this is an absolute disaster. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mike wrote the story up and I think it's an absolutely brilliant piece of writing because, because I, I always find myself getting emotional every time I read it. And I've read it so many times. And, um, and he... Um, the, 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 uh, I must tell you, when the story begins with how he looks up his old friend, Kiboko, who is a local who has a heart for evangelism, and he says, and Kiboko says to Mike, do you pray? Um, and Mike said, no, no, not really. He said, you will. You will. When you go into the swamps, you will start to pray. And so now Mike remembered that. And... So they all got down in the sand on their knees and they prayed for help. And uh, in due course, a truck arrived and 
eventually brought Phyllis and the two men to to a little airport where they were, were able to fly to a hospital in a place called Francis Town, and 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 Phyllis survived. Um, it, and she had cerebral malaria and blackwater fever. You know, so Mike called it a miracle that uh, that she survived both of those diseases. And he, yeah, he did spin it a bit. Uh, I'm sure um, um, uh, by by claiming that it was a, a miracle that they were rescued, that that a truck which wasn't planning to come there came there and, and rescued them. Was was he? Um by nature a faithful man did did or and it just didn't pray or did that did that have an effect on his faith and and moving forward from that point in life um this kind of thing was, was something that mike didn't talk easily about you know i've mentioned he didn't talk about emotional things very easily he didn't talk about religious things very easily but the context which probably you would relate to well was uh, he had what he called his 10 rules for battle and the first one was pray God daily and he really believed that and he really believed in the power of prayer and whenever there were tough times and, and we all have tough times from time to time you know he would uh, say how much he would appreciate it if, if we would pray into uh, what, what, whatever the situation was. Um, and, and in one of his books, he, he tells a lovely story about how as um, contact with the enemy was getting nearer and nearer, how the more and more um, men would turn up on a Sunday for, 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 for a church yeah. service. <laughs> Before we get into uh, the Congo in, in 1964, I believe, I just want to take a moment to remind people if you're interested in the book that we're talking about here tonight with the author, it's Mad Mike Hoare, The Legend, a biography by our guest tonight, Chris. Um, it's really a wonderful book. It, it tells you know the entire story of his dad, but it's also written from the perspective that really needs to write it from. Um, so, you know, Chris did a lot of research for this. The book includes interviews that he did with his dad, e emails with his father, um, and, and also your own childhood and, and adult recollections um, because of your relationship with him. So where, um, where can people go if they want to pick up a copy of it, Chris? All right. Um, the short answer is to go to my website, which is www.madmycore.com. It's as simple as that, and you can find out more about it uh, from the website, and then I will respond and take it from there. And Chris, I'd ask you, since we're sort of at the midway point, to um, show uh, the other books that um, are offered. Um, I'm just going to take two seconds right now just to remind people, if you haven't already, please make sure that you subscribe to this channel if you haven't. Um, and hit that little bell icon and select all notifications so you get notified whenever we go live. Um, you know, like to give us a thumbs up, leave some comments, let us know how you think we're doing. Um, and there's also a link down in the description to our Patreon page if you're interested in supporting the stream and seeing the bonus segments that we do. And there's also a link down there for uh, stuff like this. We, we got merch, we got coffee mugs, t-shirts, all that good stuff. So without further ado, uh, Chris, do you want to show us, um, your father was a prolific writer. He wrote like what, seven or eight books during his lifetime. That's right. Yes. Yes. As I've said, he, he was a man of many, many talents and, um, he loved Shakespeare and poetry and these things helped him to, to become a good writer. I think he was a brilliant writer and yes, he wrote seven books. Three of them are set in the Congo. And I'll just show you them, yeah, if I may. Here mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they are. Uh, where are you? Okay. Yeah. Uh, th these are the seven books. Uh, no, back the other way. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So 
Uh, they are Congo Mercenary, the Seychelles Affair, the Sailing One, Sylvia, the Last Days of the Cathars, which is uh, something completely different, and then one about all his non-military adventures, and then the Road to Kalamata, which is the Katanga story, and Congo Warriors, which is short stories about the mercenary life in the Congo. It's um, uh, no, whimsical, and uh, he said it was his favorite book. Well, with that said, what, can you tell us a little bit, Chris, what was the political situation in the Congo in 1964 that led up to your father's um, eventually hitting the ground there? Yes. Um, briefly, Katanga had been brought back into the fold in 1963 by uh, yeah, the United Nations, probably you could say. And, uh, but as I said, the Cold War was still going on and the red influence was still very strong and a rebellion uh, was fomented in the east of the country. In fact, there were a number of rebellions, but the main one was in the east of the country, and it spread across the country towards the west to the capital, Leopoldville, uh, to the point that they were not that far away, and something had to be done. And the government of the Congo decided to bring back, strangely enough, the a man called Moise Shambi, who had been the head of Katanga and had gone into exile. Uh, and now, on the 1st of July, 1964, he was brought back to solve the problem. And probably between the CIA and Shambi and his army man, Mobutu, they hatched a plan to employ mercenaries. And I... I quote in, in my book from a fascinating document um, which describes a meeting between the Americans in the form of Avril Harriman and the Belgian Spark, where they discuss what should happen. And the, the plan actually was for 4,000 mercenaries to, to be employed, you know, 1,000 within seven days, and they are going to, to, to retake the country. The Belgians are going to supply the weapons and the boots, and the Americans are going to supply the, the airplanes and the boats and just about the food and just about everything else. Uh, so, so it was against that background that um, uh, they called Mike and they said, can you do it? And, and he said, yes, I can. And, uh, and, and then the wheels started turning. And I mean, it, again, uh, same cast of characters. I was very, you, you quote him in, in your book. I was very close to Don, Don Rickard, uh, though he was not there in South Africa because of the events we had just talked about. <laughs> the whole idea of raising a mercenary force plainly was the American's idea passed off to Mobutu as his idea. A thousand men retake Stanleyville. Oh, Mobutu didn't think that big, but he had the CIA behind him and he could get what he liked. Without doubt, the Americans funded the 1964 and 1965 mercenaries. Fortunately for Mobutu, he had been adopted by the CIA, who were there then in the form of Larry Delvin, or Devlin, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, that's right. Um, the, the, the thing I find very interesting about this is why? What, what was so important for the Americans that they wanted to support the Congo? I mean, the Congo was just another country in, in the middle of darkest Africa. And it took me a long time to find the answer. And I found the answer in Devlin's book. He had been the chief of station for the CIA in Leopold in the early 60s. And... He explained it very succinctly. And I wonder if people know what it was. 
It was a mineral beginning with the letter C. And it wasn't copper. And it wasn't coal tan. It was cobalt. Now, I didn't know this, but cobalt is used in weaponry, uh, systems, missiles, and, of course, in rocketry. And what we haven't talked about now is that the space race was also a very, very big thing. Uh, for those who are too young, it was, the race was between Russia and America to get to the moon. And so cobalt was an essential uh, mineral for making these spacecraft. And where does cobalt occur in the world? It occurs in the Congo and in Russia. So if you haven't got a source of cobalt, you are out of the space race. Huh. And um, America said, right, we, we are going to keep uh, the Congo for the West. Uh, and, and there was, but, behind, behind hmm? the, the rebellion, I mean, there was also the Chinese communist influence uh, Kay Guevara entered the, th the entered the theater at a certain point here. So there was certainly a Cold War standoff taking place. No, absolutely. And I think the bigger picture was that, well, certainly the fear was that the Reds were going to get the Congo. And then there are nine countries surrounding the Congo, and they were going to come south. And uh, South Africa at that time was producing scandalous quantities of gold, uh, 25 and a half million fine ounces of gold a year. Uh, so, so that would have been a glittering pr prize, including command of the sea route around the Cape, you know, between the East and the West. So the fear was that that's what the, the Reds were going to do. And so they, they had to be stopped and they had to be stopped uh, in the pump. And so your father, a ardent anti-communist, anti-Marxist, is brought into the fold. How did he get recruited to lead uh, these mercenaries? Well, you see, he had already made a name for himself in, in a small way and met some people in Katanga. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the mercenaries in Katanga had stayed on as an aide to Shambi. And so when, uh, when Shami came back to, to Leopoldville, uh, he got this guy to, to phone Mike and, and, and Mike um, went up to the Congo. You, you, you know, he was the first choice. And so these become the, the famous wild geese, five commando. That's right. Um, the... The wild geese w were uh, what the Irish mercenaries who, who didn't want to be subservient to the British several centuries ago uh, were, were dubbed, and they went and fought in the European armies. Now, I've, I've, I've mentioned how Mike didn't uh, like the way the French mercenaries conducted themselves, and in fact, the media dubbed them laser for the frightful ones uh, because yes they they would festoon themselves with uh, with uh, ammo belts and, and daggers and, and hand grenades and, and all the rest of it and uh, Mike didn't, didn't approve of that and so in what I thought was rather a clever move he wanted to distance himself from that image so he he, he dubbed his men the wild geese, and of course, it, 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 it caught on, caught the public imagination, and uh, I, I think the reality is that one could never really get away from uh, some of the, the, the yeah, the, 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 the bad things that they did, but uh, dubbing them the wild geese certainly helped. And it's, I mean, for a mercenary army, I mean, Mike was a disciplinarian. He, he would have them out in like formation, doing inspections, making them form up. Like he wasn't messing around at all. Well, you see, he believed that, yes, there was no uh, other authority right. except for him. 
So, so how are you going to keep discipline and morale? And so this was his way of doing it. And, and I've heard stories of guys who would literally send them back to Johannesburg for wearing the wrong color cap. So, you know, he, he, he gave them to understand that it was his way or the highway. And yes, he had uh, MPs who would, would enforce it. And I've heard him described as a warlord and, and so on. But, you know, for the greater purpose, which was to, to keep discipline and achieve their, their military objectives. And, and there were a few incidents uh, descri- that you describe in the book. There was one, one of his men uh, murders an eight-year-old boy. Um, who said that the person sounds like maybe they were mentally ill to begin with. Um, and Mike had to deal with that. Another, another mercenary who raped and murdered a local girl and threw her body in the river. And, and your, your father did not mess around with that guy either. <laughs> yes, that's right. And, and this, this story uh, has uh, sometimes got Mike into a, a bit of uh, trouble explaining, you know, in uh, the comfort of uh, the cities of the West, you know, how such, such disciplinary measures were necessary just briefly. Uh, they held a, uh, an informal court martial and found the man guilty. And Mike decided that uh, they should all write down on a piece of paper the punishment the man deserved and whichever punishment was uh, agreed on, whoever had uh, proposed that punishment would have to carry it out. Uh, now, this guy had been a professional footballer. And Mike thought appropriate punishment would be the removal of his big toes. And, uh, and so, so they all agreed that would be a good punishment. And so Mike took him down to the river and shot off his, his big toes. And, and, and of course, it's a, it's a horrendous story. But it served the purpose right. of making sure that uh, discipline yeah. was maintained. Right. Yeah, that, that's interesting because, like in the United States military, we have the United uh, the UCMJ, which is the military justice. When you don't have a force like that behind it's you, anarchy, or or a higher authority behind you, how do you corral these people? And there, there was the story yes. you you could never. I mean, in the book, you say you could never quite get it out of your dad. I think it was the guy who murdered the child, and your father said something like, "I took care of him forever." Yes, he said, I fixed him for good. And he, he, he wouldn't talk about that. I, I, I don't know what, right. what, what, what the upshot was. But beyond some of those, those dark moments, um, there was also, I mean, I think what turned your dad and the wild geese into a legend, their finest moment, was that they were running all over the country rescuing hostages, and they really did legitimately save a lot of lives. Yes. Um, as, as I've said, their, their objective was to rid the country of these communist rebels. There was no talk of rescuing hostages. Mm-hmm. But what the rebels did, as things, as the tide turned against them, was they started taking the missionaries. Uh, hostage and abusing them and and in many cases they they would rape them all the time and and kill them and so it was a, a desperate situation and after Stanleyville the authorities the Americans and the British and others approached Mike and said listen can you do us a favor you know we've got uh, you know 43 missionaries uh, stuck in such and such a place will you rescue them and so for about a month nearly every day they went rescuing these people and uh, i think the number given is about two thousand and sometimes they were too late you know they would arrive and find a pile of uh, of, of, of robes and uh, nuns clothing on, on the side of the river and you knew that they were gone mm-hmm. um but very often they did 
they were able to to rescue. And and I believe this was th their finest hour. Um, yes, uh, I'm I'm not saying that they were they were angels. In fact, mm -hmm. you know who are you going to get when you call for mercenary soldiers? Or, or back in the day, right? Uh, you you're going to get guys who who don't fit in anywhere else. Um, you know they they're out of work. They're unemployable. Um, and they think, well, yeah, let's give it a shot. And, and yes, a, 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 lot, a lot of them were, um, you know, not very nice people. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to pretend that they were choir boys, but they got the job done. Right. Yeah, there, there's so, uh, so many accounts in here where, you know, literally rescuing little children who, who grow up and are like forever thankful and writing writing notes to you and your dad uh, as they, you know, reach middle age, um, mixed in with those hor horrific accounts of where they find, like, the stew pot filled with human limbs. I, I mean, I, I can't imagine what those guys experienced over there. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, you know, yeah, one, one of my sources told me they did find human remains in a pot at the back of a, of a mission station. So, you know, this is darkest Africa, um, and and uh, and yes, they, they they some of those uh, children. I'm in, in touch with them who, who were rescued. You know, they are now serving useful lives. Uh, the one in particular in Canada, another one in Australia. Highly qualified people, you know, contributing to society. We talk about the mercenaries and maybe what kind of people that might attract. What was, uh, did, did uh, Mike ever mention, like, what was the recruiting process? How did they get a thousand people and, and you know, in, in a short period of time? How did they find these people? Did he ever talk about that? Yes, uh, that, that part is, is, is well known. They literally put uh, advertisements in the newspapers saying uh, fit young men looking for employment uh, with a difference <laughs> you know phone this number you know excellent pay uh, start immediately and <laughs> mike mike was exasperated because he was in the congo and the recruiters were in Johannesburg and salisbury and um were sending the wrong or the kind of men that Mike didn't want. You know, he, he, he described them as bums and layabouts. You know, yeah. he didn't want bums and layabouts. He wanted, you know, adventurers, uh, people who had maybe been in the army, they had been hunters or, 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 or whatever it was. That's, that's what he wanted. And so eventually, you know, they started getting a better quality person coming through. He, he says here, you quote, uh, you quote Mike saying, let me begin by saying that anybody commanding a unit of mercenary soldiers who is sensitive to adverse criticism of his actions by the press has very little chance of performing his duty successfully. It is quite impossible for the average person to imagine the horror and loathing a commander of soldiers will face from time to time when dealing with riffraff, bums, uneducated layabouts, and others who may emerge from time to time in his unit, most likely untrained, uninvited, and totally friendless, and who commit this type of atrocity without the slightest regret or understanding of their actions. And how, as a unit commander, do you deal with these characters? In the cold light of after years, the bare facts of such events lead one to remember and regret them sincerely. But memories are short, and in many cases one deliberately obscures them from memory because of their intrinsic horror. What I still remember about this incident is that anybody in my unit who had in mind committing any such action himself and ensuing actions was in no doubt that he would deserve the extremely severe punishment that I would certainly have awarded him. Yes, that, that um, is a statement that Mike made when, you know, he was about 95 when, when he wrote that, uh, that long paragraph. Wow. I had asked him, I used to ask him questions when I was writing the biography and his memory was not so good as he got on, and he found it convenient to reply in writing. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, uh, 
how he felt now about having shot off that man's toes. Mm -hmm. And that was his reply. And I mean, that is a brilliant piece of, of, of writing and a, and, a, and a clever justification and, uh, for doing what he did. I, I, the thing I have to respect so much about your father is he, he lived exactly the life that he wanted to live and he made no apologies about it. None whatsoever. <laughs> it's, that's right. That's right. And 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 yes, uh, you, you, you know things did go wrong eventually, and and he paid quite a high price. Yeah. But uh, but he pressed on, and and he didn't look back. Uh, you know, he never talked about the Seychelles uh, unless you asked him, and then he would briefly answer and and carry on. He he was a man for the present and the future. And he was always planning something else uh, for the future. So how did things end up, in, how did things wind down in the Congo for this, this operation that your father was involved in at, at the behest of the CIA? Yes. Well, after, after about a year, they, uh, they took uh, the important city of uh, Barak. From the Cuban perspective, quite in depth. Okay. So, so they were uh, assisting at the Battle of Baraka, which was a pretty fierce battle, and uh, eventually uh, they, the, the rebels withdrew. And that was pretty much the, the end of the main uh, attempt to... to, to yeah. <laughs> yes, um, yes, the, after... <clears throat> after the Congo, the, um, Mike was sought after as somebody who could solve problems, um, mainly in Africa, but also in the East. Um, and, and he did follow up on that, but it, it actually all came to nothing. He, he never found actual work as a, as a mercenary leader uh, after the Congo. In elsewhere in Africa or, or in the Indonesia East. Indonesia and a few other places. Sorry, I missed that. Uh, that he, he was trying to raise like a mercenary foreign legion in Rhodesia, for instance. And then you talk about Singapore and, and um, I think Cambodia was another place. Yes, that's right. Singapore was the base uh, from which he was trying, he was operating. Uh, but, but none of it got off the ground. Uh, and then, of course, in, uh, in 1977, he, he got uh, one of these dream phone calls. How would you like to be the military advisor to the filming of The Wild Geese? It's going to be shot in South Africa. And guess what? Richard Burton is going to play you. So, so Richard Burton was one of Mike's uh, heroes because he was a Shakespearean actor. And I can remember as a child, we had long playing records with Richard Burton playing or reading from Shakespeare. And Mike loved that. And, uh, and, now, and now he was going to meet Burton and, uh, and assist him with don't hold the rifle like this, hold it like that. <laughs> and so on. And um, one of my favorite stories about the, the filming of The Wild Geese, and this, this tells you a, a bit about Mike as a leader, the script called for Burton. Now the, 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 the mercenaries who are rescuing a black president are in trouble and Burton has to encourage his men and the script calls for him to stand on a balcony and his men are down there and he's going to encourage them. And Mike said, no, 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 it's not done like that. You've got to get on the back of a jeep and get your men around you and look them in the eye and encourage them. And so that was one of the small ways in which he contributed to the success of that film. Did, did he interact with, I mean, obviously as, since they were both lovers of Shakespeare and, and words, did they find that, that sort of kindred spirit in each other? Did they find that kinship? The, unfortunate fact of the matter is that no matter who you are, these big stars will not talk to you. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, 
Mike w was fortunate to spend a bit of time with Richard Burton, and he says how Richard Burton uh, recited some famous lines from Marlowe and from Shakespeare for him, and and that was that was all he wanted. So now I'm not going to, to lie and pretend that Burton and Mike became great pals. They, they didn't. But, you know, I think it's sufficient that, that... But Mike wasn't like that. He didn't attach great importance to the fact mm -hmm. that Burton had played the Mike Hall character. Right. He, he never even mentioned it. Right. I think it's interesting also to mention maybe at this point um, some of the, the racial issues at play during the time and that there's even controversy about this film and some of the uh, Afri or black African actors were hesitant to play their roles in this film. Um, but anyone who's watched it would, you know, the way it was actually made is it's about the cooperation between uh, white and black. One of the South African characters uses racial slurs against the Africans. Later on in the film, he realizes they have more in common than he thought. It's kind of a it's kind of campy a campy take on race relations, but it is interesting to see that in there. And I thought some of the uh, I was very interested to see some of the comments that your father made in this book, where his solution to the red menace in Africa was to that they should try to build a black middle class to neutralize any sort of communist insurgency that may come around because now the black population is as invested in the society as the whites are um and there, there'd be no reason to have an uprising and i i, I think that that's um very uh uh i don't want to say superficial but obviously making that happen is much more complicated but in a, the gist of it your father had essentially figured it out what needed to be done yes that's right it, it would be all too easy to say oh, you know, he's just a hired killer and, and he would rather go around killing people. But Mike uh, w was a thinker. And yes, even as far back as 1975, uh, he proposed that, uh, that solution. Uh, well, I, I heard him talking about it before that, but uh, at, at a public event. And of course, that didn't go down very well because he even suggested that there should be uh, a, a special tax uh, imposed to, to do exactly what you just outlined. Um, you, you said it actually didn't go down so well when he was asked to come and lecture some of the more right-wing political groups in South Africa. Yes, that's right. Well, mostly because, because of the financial aspect that uh, people were now going to Mm -hmm. already paying enough tax and now this guy wants us to pay more tax mm -hmm. uh, yeah from that point of view so i think maybe the last thing that uh i'd like to talk about tonight with you is uh seychelles which by, by yes. this by this point you are a adult and you're not just a kid kind of watching your father do these things now you're sort of involved on the periphery of it yes that's that's right. One day he, well, I knew he, he was up to something because he, he kept, you know, I was living in, in London at that time in the late 70s and he, he, he kept pitching up like every few months. And uh, I, I would say, what's going on? You know, and he, he was a great sort of hand actor and he would, he would look sort of furtively from side to side and he'd say, skull battery, you know, and... Uh, but, but of course, he knew how to keep his mouth shut. He, oh, he was very, very good at that. And, and so I, I never knew anything about it. And then one day he said, uh, uh, I want to come and see you. And uh, I was living about an hour's drive away um, back in South Africa. And uh, he told me that he was, uh, had been approached to overthrow the government of the Seychelles. And... Uh, and he was busy with that process, and he needed an extra pair of hands. And um, I was still young and foolish, and so I agreed to to help him. And so the the this entire coup plot was behind the scenes, sponsored by the South African government, although they would later deny knowledge of it. 
Um, I think that is slightly, I'm not saying it's incorrect, but it's putting slightly the wrong slant on the thing. The, 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 the originators of this plan were uh, Seychelwa, who were known as the exiles. Mm -hmm. They were the conservative supporters of the previous prime minister, a man called Jimmy Mansham, who had been deposed himself in a coup. So basically now they were trying to reinstate Mansion instead of René, who was a socialist and obviously friendly with the uh, Russians and Chinese and so on. Um, so, so yes, the South African government did get involved. Um, it's very strange uh, in, in, in these days to imagine how that could have happened. But those were strange times. Yeah. And uh, the, the South African government, of course, was involved in all sorts of dirty tricks and car bombs. And uh, they, they regarded uh, the onslaught, they called it the total onslaught, um, uh, as, as, as uh, you know, something that had to be opposed. So all, in that context, uh, it was very different from today. And so it wasn't that unusual. You know, remember Denard had, uh, was conducting coups all over the place. And um, so Mike was approached and uh, it, 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 it could have been done. But there were some problems and money was one of the big problems. And the plot, uh, as I recall, was that the mercenaries were going to go fly in on commercial air with Kalashnikovs in a false bottom of their suitcase, and they were, what was it, like the Royal Order of Froth Blowers, like a rugby beer drinking club or something like this? <laughs> well, you see, now this was Mike at his best again. You know, we'd, we'd had the wild geese. <laughs> um, now somebody proposed, all right, so he recruited 50 men to depose the, the government, there were other ways of getting there, which all fell through. And now they were going to fly in on a, on a charter flight. And, and they had to have a name. And there was actually a group that existed after the First World War in Britain called the Ancient Order of Frog Blowers. And they were a group of beer drinkers who were also supporters of charities for the underprivileged uh, and so on. So Mike... You know, this uh, would s sort of take the focus away from what, what they were actually after trying to do. And, um, yeah, uh, that, that was the name. And, of course, it stuck. Um, it, it, it just appealed, you know, and it stuck. And But, of course, this whole plan went sideways and didn't quite work out the way they had hoped it would. Yes. Um, you know, people ask me, you know, what were the reasons for the failure? And, and, and we can look at that. But the, 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 the actual cause was that they, they had to take their weapons in false bottom bags. And for various reasons, one was found at the, the airport when, when, when they arrived and all hell broke loose. And now they had lost the element of surprise. And um, uh, in the middle of it all, um, a Boeing 707 flying between uh, Salisbury uh, or Harare and Bombay uh, flew in uh, just to complicate matters with 65 passengers and uh, was being shelled by, by cannon fire and uh, eventually... It's a long story, but they got on the plane and uh, made sure that the pilot didn't fly to Bombay, and that he flew to Durban, where they were expecting a, a fairly uh, a friendly welcome. Because, yes, the South African government, I wouldn't say they were behind it, but they had supported it. They had supplied the weapons and probably some intelligence uh, uh, but it didn't turn out like that because the world banged up or mm -hmm. announced that South Africa would have to nail these guys. Otherwise, 
that they would withdraw landing rights just about everywhere. So, so the Southern government had, had no choice but to follow the legal route and charge them. And, and yes, they all went to jail. Uh, Mike got uh, an effect of 10 years in jail and was pardoned after, after 33 months. So, yeah, that was a, a, an example of one of Mike's adventures, which, which really went wrong. And his great prison stories that he would regale people with afterwards. And, you know, some of the tours he did, uh, one of the funnier stories, actually, uh, when he was going, I think he was touring the United States for the Wild Geese film, uh, where several people got confused. And instead of introducing him as the Congo mercenary, they introduced him as the Congo missionary. <laughs> like, Here, here's Mike. Tell, tell them how many lives you saved for Jesus in Jesus Africa. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Um, but uh, my favorite uh, a prison story w was about how an old um, prisoner who had probably spent most of his life in prison said, would you like me to tell you how to cope with mm. 10 years in prison? And Mike said, yes, I would. And he said, you identify somebody less fortunate than yourself and you help that person. Maybe when you've got some extra food, you give it to them. Or what, whatever way you can do it. And Mike, at one point, was in a, um, a plumbing team with uh, some other prisoners who happened to be black. And he found out that one, one of these guys didn't have a radio, so he arranged for him to have a radio. And, and really, you, you know, the older I get, the more I realize that that principle is applicable in, in life in general. You know, the, 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 it's actually the secret of happiness, in, in my opinion, is, is reaching out to other people and, and helping them. But yes, there were lots of uh, stories and uh, funny stories, tragic stories. Uh, yeah, they, they, in those days, there was capital punishment in, 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 uh, in the same prison where Mike was in Pretoria. And as he said, you know, men were hanged on the other side of that wall over there. Yeah. It sounded like that really affected him too, having that experience and, and hearing the yeah. uh, the black prisoners singing uh, "Hallelujah" and all of these things as they're as they're heading off to the gallows. Yeah, all night they would hold a vigil before their their, and they were all they were political prisoners, you know, a lot of them. They were not necessarily murderers. So, and and of course, Mike after that. Um, was anti-capital punishment to right till the end. The, you know, rest of the book, um, I have to say, it, it came like a little bit of a, a punch to the guts um, towards the end of the book. I mean, your father stayed very busy, um, kept his mind very sharp as long as he could. He, he lived to the age of 100. Uh, was that right, Chris? Yes, that is right, yes. 100 years old, and, and you say towards the... the final pages here um, that by 2018 he could mostly be found dozing in the sunshine, dipping into one of the books he had written, doing crosswords, reading poetry in the Bible, and fading away. Um, but as sad as that sounds, uh, on the other hand, I, I, I have to refuse to pity somebody who lived a good long life to age 100 and, and lived exactly the sort of life that he wanted to live. And I, I think... Correct me if I'm wrong, Chris. I think that's how he would want us to remember him. Yes, um, I, I don't know if he if if he ever thought about that. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't like that. Um, um, he he was modest. He, he he was not interested in being famous or or or, or, or thinking about what his legacy might be. Um, he he just got on, got on with life, you know, and uh, enjoying life. And uh, he was a very humorous man, and uh, and he kept us entertained a lot because the last ten years of his life, he he, he lived partly with us and partly with my brother, uh, so we saw we saw a lot of him. 
and so then how did uh, how did this book come about? What was the genesis of this? Was it what in his final years of his life that you began planning to write this? How, how did that happen? Um, well, look, as a journalist, um, I was acutely aware. I, I never, I know a lot of journalists. I, I never met one who wasn't absolutely fascinated by by the story. And as a journalist myself. I knew it was a, a good story and would, would, would make a, a, a good book. And I first started talking to him in 1985 about that. But he was not interested at all. And um, obviously, because he knew, you know, that, that there were uh, things that had happened that he didn't want to talk about. Like, like Rickard, for example, his great friend. Rickard was still, you know, very much a factor and he didn't want to talk about that but as the years went on he was able to to talk uh, more and more felt free to and then and then in 2005 i said come on dad you know he, he was about 85 at that time i said we've got to get on with this otherwise it's just not going to happen and and it's a good thing i did because you know one's memory fades and um so I did uh, a, a lot of recorded interviews with him in, in, uh, in 2006, and, and I started writing it in earnest then. And, but I wasn't in any rush because he, he said, uh, please don't publish it in my lifetime. Because obviously he knew there could be repercussions about certain things. And, uh, and, and, and really i so enjoyed it it was so fascinating meeting people um and doing the research in libraries and online and people all over the world helped me and uh and yeah then, then after 12 years it, it was done and i said to him well what do you think can i publish it now he said go ahead but he never read any of it and even after it was published i gave him a signed copy not interested. <laughs> but he was very old by then. You know, he was, you know, when, when you're nearly 100, you're doing well if you can just get through the day. What was that like for you? Because you're getting his story from him, but then you talk to, you, you interview other people who were present, who I imagine shine a whole new light on things, you know, their perspective. Uh, did that, uh, how, how was that for you? No, uh, I don't. I don't really know how to to answer that. Um, I, 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 I suppose the the unfortunate fact is that that uh, Mike saw. We all see things in our own way, sure. but Mike's way of seeing things was uh, quite. Uh, he would romanticize. And so sometimes he would uh, improve on the facts of the situation. And, uh, and he would say, and I, and I would say, that, that's, I was there, and that's not exactly what happened. Don't you remember? And, and he would say, got to, my boy, you don't understand. You've got to give people their money. <laughs> you know? And he would say things like that. Um, so yeah, some of so so I discovered by talking to other people that some of the things he said weren't exactly the truth, but more or less they were. Uh, did you also? I mean, did you also find times when he would maybe under talk things and and because I'm sure a oh, lot of people like really like the part where he was on the barge with a 45 shooting across the river, and you said he really downplayed <laughs> what was happening there. That that was. That, that was his nature, and that that story I have I have spoken to three different people, and they all tell the same story the same way. There was this superstructure on a barge with no protection whatsoever, and Mike was at the wheel, which was up there, and uh, and and giving the rebels hell with this <laughs> with this forty five, and all the other guys were were crouched behind. Uh, you know, barrels of water or, or, or whatever it was for protection. So he was fearless. Uh, I've heard that from many people. He was totally fearless. 
and also a bit of a showman. Uh, he, 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 he would, he would um, impart um, uh, encouragement by, by being fearless. And, and uh, you know, they would come under attack in the Congo, you know, long road straight through the jungle, and they would, uh, after an initial um, interaction, he would say to his uh, Batman, get out my map table, and he would set it up in the middle of the road and start examining the maps just to show the guys nothing to worry about. Well, I, Chris, I, I really hope people will take a look at your book. Uh, it's Mad Mike Hoare, The Legend, a biography by Chris Hoare. Um, again, what, what's the website, Chris, where they can go and find it? www. It's quite easy, Mad Mike War, what you, what you would expect, dot com. And that's the thing to do. If, if anyone's interested, just go to the website and follow your nose, and I'll be in touch. Chris, thank you so much yeah. for taking the time to come on the show tonight. And I, and I know it's super late where you are. It must be like 4.30 in the morning um, at this point. Uh, so yes. we, we really appreciate yes. it. I'll, I'm, I'm going to let you go. Uh, I just want to... To let everyone know next week uh, we're going to have an uh, old Ranger Battalion friend of mine on. We'll be talking about the Regimental Reconnaissance Company, some other uh, you know, war on terror stories from the Middle East. So I hope you guys will tune in next Friday for that. And also on Monday, check out Battleline Podcast uh, with our friends uh, Ian Scotto and, and uh, Chris Peranto. And? I was on it. And Dave is on there. Um, Chris, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we really deeply appreciate, you know, your time, your effort in all this. I mean, you are, thank you. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, it, a, a lot of people say, thank you for keeping his legacy alive. And I didn't set out to do that, but it's also at the same time pleasing to know that people are enjoying uh, you know, reading about a man who, for some reason, they admire, and uh, and in, in, in some small way, I think they try and in their own lives follow a little bit in his footsteps. Absolutely. So, thank you very much, both of you. Uh, it's been a real pleasure, and I can't believe that we've been talking for an hour and a half already. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, and uh, we'll see everyone next Friday.